Barak, chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 11 verses, but I'm going to focus on one at the end. My child, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. Be sincere of heart and steadfast. And do not be impetuous in time of adversity. Cling to him, do not leave him, that you may prosper in your last days. Accept whatever happens to you. In periods of humiliation, be patient. For in fire, gold is tested, and the chosen in the crucible of humiliation. Trust in God and he will help you. Make your way straight and hope in him. You that fear the Lord, wait for his mercy. Do not stray, lest you fall. You that fear the Lord, trust in him, and your reward will not be lost. You that fear the Lord, hope for good things, for lasting joy and mercy. Consider the generations long past and see, has anyone trusted in the Lord and been disappointed? Has anyone persevered in his fear and been forsaken? Has anyone called upon him and been ignored? For the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He forgives sins and saves in time of trouble. So considering the generations long past, Through the fraction prayer of great length, we learn that fasting and prayer are those which raised Elijah from to heaven and saved Daniel from the lion's den. And fasting and prayer are those which Moses pursued until he received the law and the commandments written with the finger of God. Fraction says that fasting and prayer are those which the people of Nineveh pursued until God had mercy on them and forgave them their sins and lifted his wrath from them. And it goes on. That fraction recalls the prophets and the apostles and the martyrs and the righteous and just. And it says that they dwelt in the mountains and deserts and holes of the earth because of their great love for Christ the King. And we too, let us fast from all evil and purity and righteousness. So the fraction goes through many generations of saints and it shows how they practically clung to Christ. Fasting and prayer are practical ways of clinging to God in whom we hope. And we say in the litany for the sick, for you are he who loosens the bound and uplifts the fallen. You're the hope of those who have no hope, the helper of those who have no helper the comfort of the faint-hearted, the harbor of those in the storm. And we can take several examples of saints who went through various trials of all different sorts and see how they clung to God and hoped in him and how he delivered them. So the first saint that I thought of was St. George. And why I thought about him is because we say he's the prince of martyrs. And I read somewhere that there's no other human being who suffered the same amount of suffering that St. George did for the sake of Christ. And so I went to one of the manuscripts about him and it says that during the year 303 AD, Diocletian summoned his aides to meet in Caesarea, a city of the Eastern Roman Empire. 
He held three general meetings with his aides, instructing them to persecute Christians. And St. George, since he had shown his excellence while serving in the army, was among these aides. Diocletian asked him to pledge their allegiance to this cause by making pagan sacrifices as proof of their loyalty. All of the aides pledged their loyalty except for the saint. He stood in front of Diocletian and admitted his belief in Christianity, telling the monarch of the Christian teachings and the godliness of the crucified Nazarene. The emperor ordered this Christian taken to prison and that a boulder be placed on his chest as a form of torture. The next morning, Diocletian ordered that the prisoner be brought before him for questioning. St. George stood steadfast and told Diocletian of his belief in the riches of the kingdom of heaven. The emperor then summoned the executioners to take the saint and have him bound to the rim of a wheel set with sharp spikes. And Diocletian admired the courage of the saint and asked him again to sacrifice to the gods to save himself. He refused Diocletian's request and welcomed the chance to martyr for Christ as his father had done. So St. George's father was also martyred. I didn't know that before. Oh, actually I did. We say it even in the, in the Arabic uh, uh, Madiha for St. George. After praying to God, he heard a voice from heaven say, Do not fear, George, I am with you. With the help of Christ, the spiked wheel had no effect upon St. George. When the saint appeared before Diocletian, not only was he unharmed, but an angelic aura had settled about him. Suddenly, two officers of the Roman army appeared before Diocletian with 2,000 soldiers and admitted their belief in Christ, and Diocletian had them all executed. He then ordered his soldiers to dig a pit and fill it with lime. The saint was then drenched with water and thrown into the pit. The water and lime would slowly destroy the saint's body. After three days, Diocletian instructed the soldiers to clear the pit. To the surprise of the soldiers and the emperor, St. George sat at the bottom of the pit unharmed. Diocletian demanded to know what type of magic St. George had used to escape his fate. The saint answered that he had not used any magic, but that he had been saved by the power of God. I'll tell you a little bit more about St. George. The emperor then ordered that iron sandals be tied to the feet of the saint and that he be made to run. As he ran, he was beaten. One of Diocletian's advisors ordered George to perform a miracle. They happened to pass by a tomb of a man who had been dead for many years. Then the man ordered St. George to resurrect this man to show the power of his God. After praying for a long time, he rolled the rock away from the tomb and the dead man was raised. The bystanders praised the strength of Christ. Diocletian asked the resurrected man who he was and when he had died. He told Diocletian that he had lived before Christ had come to the world. And because he was an idolater, he had burned in the fires of Hades during all those years. Many idolaters were converted to Christianity because of this great miracle. So many, many miracles happened in the life of St. George. Of course, St. George, he died in the early 300s. So the person who was raised from the dead, he had been dead for over 300 years. Um, many, many miracles happened. And God delivered him. 
And even when God wanted to end his strife, he wanted to end it so that he can find rest, no more torture in this world. So St. George is a great example of one who trusted in Christ, who hoped in him, and the Lord never let him down. Now, that's one of the martyrs, and the one I chose was, the, we call him the Prince of Martyrs. But we also have other saints. One of them, I don't know if you know, Saint Cyrus. Cyrus is, uh, in Arabic, it's Karas, Saint Karas. And one thing that was written about Saint Karas was that in complete isolation in the inner desert, where no one ventured to live, this saint followed a saintly life and received no man until the eve of his death on the 7th of Epip, the year 182, Anno or the 1st of July, 40, 466 AD, when Emba Bemur, the elder of the church of Shahid, Wadin Matrun, visited him. Only Christ had visited him in his isolation before Amba Bimma. And Saint Bimma was a witness to one visit in which he saw Christ go up to Saint Karas and kiss him, even as does a brother who has arrived from a strange region when he meets his friend. It was said about Amba Karas that more than 50 years he hadn't seen anybody. And of course, during the times that he was sick, he didn't have a physician to go to, and to get medicine. When he was hot, he couldn't find shade. When he was cold, he didn't have a storage where he can grab an extra galabeya or anything, or a blanket. The only thing that he had was Christ. And we learned from Desert Fathers that they, they said the name of the Lord, they prayed the Jesus prayer in many forms, and that's what comforted them. That's what satisfied them when they were hungry. It quenched their thirst when they were thirsty. And it comforted them when they were sick or heavy-hearted. So... What happened at the end, St. Bimur saw Christ visit Ambakaras so that we can hear about the life of this great saint. He had nobody in his isolation at all for all these years, but Christ himself was the one who comforted him. And that's why he hoped in him and he was a loyal and devoted to Christ. Even at the end, Christ said to him, all these years, you, you pleased me. I want to do something for you and please you before I receive you, take you to myself. And so, you know, the story goes that he asked to, here's David the prophet, sing the Psalms, praying and, and using his 10 stringed instrument and so uh, the Lord told the Archangel Michael to go and, and call David the prophet, and he came. And as David was playing, uh, the soul of St. Karas came out while he was joyful. And, and that's how the Lord received him. Uh, another great saint, the intercessor of your church, and who was really an inspiration for me, uh, to join the monastery was St. Anthony. And it was said that when Abba Anthony thought about the depth of the judgments of God, he asked, Lord, how is it that some people die when they are young, while others drag on to extreme old age? And why are there those who are poor and those who are rich? Why do make it men prosper 
and why are the just in need? And St. Anthony heard a voice answering him, Anthony, keep your attention on yourself. These things are according to the judgment of God, and it is not to your advantage to know anything about them. So we might have the same idea and the same thoughts. Why are some people going through very difficult tribulations? And why are others living a very good, easy life? Why are we during this time experiencing a pandemic? And we have all these questions. And the angel told St. Anthony, think about yourself and what you need to do and leave the things of God for God to handle. And I think that this is very practical advice for us too. It can help us in all these thoughts that come up. Now to show how St. Anthony really hoped and clung to God. Concerning him, one day Satan came to the blessed man who was singing the Psalms of David. So we see something common among St. Karas and Ambantanis. And Satan was gnashing his teeth upon him loudly, but the blessed Anthony ceased not to sing, and he was comforted and helped by the grace of our Lord. That's what it says in the life of Anthony by St. Athanasius, that he was helped by the grace of our Lord. One night while St. Anthony was standing up and keeping watch in prayer, Satan gathered together all the wild beasts of the desert and brought them against him. They were so many in number that he can hardly have left one beast in its den. As they compassed about him on every side and with threatening looks, they were ready to leap upon him. He looked at them boldly and said to them, if you have received power over me from the Lord, Draw near and do not delay, for I am ready for you. So he was almost saying that if God gave you permission to attack me, then I'm ready. How many of us can have confidence to say, Lord, I'm ready. When it's time, whichever way you decide, I'm ready to come to you. I know I still have a very long way to go, and so I trust that God's going to give me time to get ready. And then St. Anthony said, If you have received power over me from the Lord, draw near and do not delay, for I am ready for you. But if you have made ready and come at the command of Satan, get back to your places and do not tarry, for I am a servant of Jesus, the conqueror. When the blessed man had spoken these words, Satan was straight away driven away by the mention of the name of Christ like a sparrow before a hawk. And there's not enough time today to reflect on many more saints and how they teach us to hope and trust in God. But I just want to mention two sayings of one of the saints of recent history, and his words are very comforting and encouraging. Saint Pope Carolus VI said, whatever may come from the enemy, may the Lord cause it to fail. Rest assured and do not reflect on the matter too much. Leave it in God's hands. For man cannot prevent anything that the Lord has ordained to happen. And the second saying of Baba Krulus is, Do not reflect too much on the affairs of this life. Do not worry about anything. Cast your burdens upon the Lord and he shall sustain you. Just as he sustained the three saintly youth. St. George, St. Cyrus, St. Anthony, 
and all the saintly women and men in every generation that hoped in him. Glory be to God. Now, if you want to have a discussion or if you want to talk about anything, I, I welcome that. Uh, Abuna, I have a question. It's Samir. Uh, Dr. Samir. How are you, Abuna? Wahishna. Nice to see you. Thank you for being with us. I don't see you. Um, there... That's better? Shesh, I know what it. Thank you, Abuna. Nice to have you, Abuna. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. <clears throat> Abuna, sometimes uh, when we hear, yeah, some people, when we hear what you have been saying, say that this is very difficult for me. Yeah, and this, uh, whether the three young men or St. George or St. Anthony, uh, sometimes we feel this life, we are very, 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 very far uh, away from this level. Can yeah. you discuss with that, please? Yes, when we compare the, the difficulties that we have to theirs, we see that it doesn't compare. And if they went through such hardship, the hardships that we face is not as extreme. And still they were able to conquer because of their trust in God and their clinging to Him. And if I compare... My son, the burden of not getting into the school that I wanted to get into. To what St. George suffered. It's not comparable. But if we cling to God, he'll give us still a good a way of success, a way to do well. He'll open another door. And so, knowing the life of the saints and learning from their um, love to God, that can also encourage us in our own trials, in our own difficulties, which are very small compared to what they went through. And you're right. That, that's, that's how exactly I feel that our problems in life are nothing in comparison, for example, to the, uh, to the tribulations of the saints. And yet we have very difficult time to live a Christian life, I would mean, or a life that can witness to Christ in our very day-to-day -day basis. Is there any uh, like advice you can give us on how to, to do that? Well, if I give you any advice, it's the advice that I learned from the great fathers that I grew up with, with you. And the advice that, that I get from, from you even, Doctor, about learning uh, the scriptures and keeping the commandments written in the scriptures and uh, benefiting from them because they're able to guide us and to help us and to grace us and correct us and comfort us. Um, but we have these treasures and sometimes we, we're, we're so distracted with other things. Um, the advice that Abu Nahanna always gave us to pray the Jesus prayer and to say his name with strength and to trust in him. The advice to, to pray. And we see fasting and prayer in the, in, in the situation of Nineveh. It caused God to lift his wrath from them and he saved them. So we have the practical means of fasting. Fasting from evil not fasting just from food, fasting from just the worldly things. And I like how you use the modern day things to glorify God. And having this Zoom chat, which con connects people from all over, but using it to encourage each other and to hear the word of God and to bring people together because we have time now. 
And when you look at the benefits that we have right now, we have time. Maybe if nothing happened these days, we would still be distracted and everyone would be into their own life and their own things. But now everyone is, everyone's concern is not only for themselves, but for their loved ones, for the people that they know everywhere. So all these uh, beautiful things God gave us so that we can encourage each other. Kind of related. Hear me? Hi, Mark. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Abuna. How are you? <laughs> uh, I have a question that kind of relates to what you're saying, but it, it, has so, it has to do with a reflection I had on um, some reading from scripture I was doing the other day. And I underlined the verses here. So basically, looking at the same stories, um, it gives me a different perspective than that and it relates to Moses' words and this might sound very pessimistic but just hear it out uh this is when uh Moses hears the people weeping um they're constantly murmuring over and over um and so Moses says to God I am not able to carry all this people alone the burden is too heavy for me if thou wilt deal thus with me kill me at once if I find favor in thy sight, that I may not see my wretched. And that those last words are, are something that are very resonant with me. And it's even worse because I'm not dealing with all of what Moses is dealing with. But when I deal with such small things and I see it in the way that Moses is seeing it, uh, where I can't handle it, I see how wretched I am. Like I can't handle these small things. And so it actually makes me feel worse rather than, you know, it, it, it's hard. You know, sometimes seeing the saints doing so well. Yes, but we see, we see at the same time that because Moses was doing God's work and he was trusting in God, he depended on God. So God had mercy not only on him, but on his people. We see that also in the example of Abraham, how he interceded. And if there were those that were righteous, God would have spared the people as well. Because God is a merciful God. That's his nature. And so that actually is encouraging because we shouldn't rely on ourselves. So even in this case, Moses he couldn't rely on himself. And he said, Lord, if you're not going to have mercy, then blot out my name too. But God had mercy because, because Moses' prayer was very humble and he was meek and he trusted in God. He didn't, he didn't have any pride in himself. And so that's why God uh, ha had mercy and helped him. Yeah, my my, um, I was thinking more of like, I I trust in God, but I don't. I often don't trust myself. God is so great, so I see myself as so horrible. Uh, and it's a good feeling to have. Okay. <laughs> Abuna, I was um, I was recently somebody sent over a link about uh, Pope Carillus and his life. And um, I was recently having a conversation with a bunch of my friends being like, you know, I, I don't really, I'm not really feeling God, you know, it, this last week of Lent, I'm not really feeling God. We're doing these things. We're doing meetings like this, but not feeling God. And um, it's, it's funny how as a Pope, even his only answer was prayer, right. To everything. And people, uh, people got so frustrated at him. They would be complaining to other bishops and to each other and to the media that the only answer Pope Carillus ever gave was pray, just pray. And it's going to be okay. Just pray. And it's going to be fine. Um, and I think just because the world, I think got more complicated, we've also complicated our own uh, theology, our own religion. Um, and, and you started off this conversation by, by saying, you know, fast and pray, right? That those are the fundamentals. That's, that's where we start. And then we go from there. And I think a lot of the time we are, um, we, we can sometimes overcomplicate it. Um, 
but given our situation, given the world we live in, uh, you know, it makes sense why we overcomplicate it. But I wonder what you, what you think. So when we talk about fasting, we mean to refrain from the worldly things. Mm. It's not just a matter of change of food. It's, you know, if there are certain things that we do, especially sin, if we can refrain from that, cease from sinning, and focus more on God's things, focus more on God's words, which are able to save us, and even just to sit quietly and reflect on life and how precious it is. And, and to pray doesn't mean just to say words and to open a book and read it and a checklist that we go through, but it's, it's a heart that's connected with another heart. It's a relationship. And it doesn't even have to be with words. Know that when we speak with our hearts, there's someone there that's receiving what we're saying, that's listening to us, and that loves us more than we can imagine, not just more than we know, but more than we can ever imagine. It's trust that we're beloved and that the one who created us, he wants us with him forever. It's not just words. It's a relationship and clinging to that. And that's what prayer is. When we have trouble and we open our heart and express everything that we feel to God, and even the things that's very hard to express, but to, without words, lay it before him, knowing that he knows, trusting that he knows, so he's going to answer our prayer. And we don't do that as often as we should. Even when we come to pray, sometimes we're not focused. There have been many liturgies that we've come in and out, and we've said the words, but maybe, myself included, I didn't say them with all my heart. But we can uh, get better at that by practicing. And by practicing lifting our hearts to God, uh, that'll become easy for us to do. It'll become the normal thing for us to do. But we're not going to get there until we do it and then practice praying. I think um, somebody have a question. I, I hear somebody unmuted. You want to ask a question? Anybody else? No. Okay. I have a question. I have a question. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. Abuna. Hey, Abuna. How are you? Hi. Good to see you. Good to see um, you. So the, the question is, is uh, piggybacking off of Mina's is that um, some of the conversation that we have a lot of times is about um, urgency in our spiritual life that sometimes we become cold or slothful because we're not, we don't realize how much we need Christ, that we're a little content or that um, we're distracted from the things that are around us. Um, so going into Holy Week, do you have any advice um, or any meditations for us to think about uh, as we go through Holy Week with Christ on, on how to really prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for um, going on this journey this next week with Christ? It's a beautiful question. Thank you. Well, let's pray that God would teach us how to pray. Let's pray asking God to make our hearts ready 
for him. Because sometimes our hearts aren't ready. We're not prepared. In the monastery, what we are accustomed to doing is waking up very early before we get distracted with different responsibilities and walking to a, a, a dim, lightly lit uh, church and we sit quietly so that we can prepare our hearts to receive the bridegroom. Many times we go into things without preparing. So God gave us the time now to sit quietly. So when we sit quietly, we can reflect on an icon. We can hold a prayer rope. We can quietly calm our thoughts and, and lift our hearts to God to prepare our hearts to receive him. I think we need to benefit from the quiet that we have these days. We, we tend to want to run out. Someone told me a funny joke that now they understand why their dog always wants to run out when the door opens. Um, because our thoughts are out, outside. But why don't we sit and calm our thoughts a little bit and ask the Lord to prepare our thoughts, our minds, our hearts uh, for the coming week. And we don't need a priest to pray Pascha. And if you sit quietly and you pray Thuk Tetikon or you read scripture quietly, calmly, not rushed, sometimes when we're in church, the de deacon is reading quickly, and so our thoughts aren't reflective. But when we're at home, we can go at our own pace. There might be a certain word that you feel God is he's saying it to you specifically. And that's how we work with St. Anthony. There was one word that the Lord said uh, through the reader that moved St. Anthony to go and sell what he had. So quiet your thoughts and lift your hearts and ask God to give you the word that you need for your life. It can be on a daily basis, not just for the whole of your life, but on a daily basis. Lord, what do you want to tell me today? You might see the whole of the readings. It's huge. And you might not be able to get through all of it. But at least look for that one word that, um, that you receive from the Lord that will move you, that will guide your life. And I think that that's the best way to benefit from this week. Oh, I believe you had uh, had something you wanted to ask. Yeah, hi, Abby. How are you? Hi, Paul. How's everything? Good. Good, thank God. Uh, so something I've been reflecting on now, this is uh, what, week four now in quarantine, is uh, <laughs> one of the definite reflections is with how much, you know, there's so many Zoom meetings going on, so many talks going on, so many Bible studies going on, I know this is Otsak's first, which is a miracle in and of itself. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I know many youth that, for example, you know, thank God they're attending these meetings. Thank God they're attending these Bible studies. But with Otsak here emphasizing the quiet time and a life of prayer, a word to live by, at what point are you living and, and not listening anymore? And I think that that's like something that maybe we kind of lose sight of is that we're constantly listening, 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 that we're not really truly developing our own personal relationships with Christ. And yeah, I mean, the reflection that I've had over the past couple of weeks now is that many youth are kind of falling into this trap now of thinking that because I'm listening to all these sermons, I'm attending these Bible studies, my spiritual life is A-OK, -okay, and my relationship with God is A-OK, -okay, um, not 
you know, thinking that I might need the personal time and the quiet time and the prayer time. Um, even yani fadir is like betul yani kilmet manfa. Give me a word to live by, not give me words for the whole day <laughs> to live by for five minutes. So I wanted to hear Utsak's thoughts on that. So the prayers don't end when we uh, close the agveya. Uh, liturgy doesn't end. I know it's a time that the churches aren't, you know, the doors are closed. May God open it until the end of ages. But liturgy continues after we leave the church. We can judge ourselves not by the hour that we spend on Zoom per day these days, but by what we do outside of that. What does the rest of my day look like? What am I doing for the rest of the day? Am I serving my family members with love? Am I praying for them and for others? Am I, am I serving others by other means? Am I reading scripture and be, being satisfied by it? Like, what am I doing? Or am I spending time in sinful things? Or am I lazy? Or am I wasting my time by various means? So we can judge ourselves. Nobody can judge us appropriately. We're the only ones who know what we're doing outside of this time or outside of the public prayers or for the rest of the week. If we're in church for three to five hours per week, but I have many, many more hours, hundreds of hours, what am I doing for the rest of my hours? And so we can judge ourselves. I think that when we hear the one word in church or through scripture when we read it, that should affect the rest of my day. It, it would reflect in how I deal with people, with my siblings, with my parents, with my spouse, with my children. And I think we can... Uh, we can judge for ourselves if what we're doing in you know those few hours if it's really making a change or directing my life or not or are we hypocrite because the pharisees were hypocrites they would look so good in front of people but then in their own personal life they weren't doing what pleases god they were judging others they were not doing what they were teaching etc so we're the only ones who can judge ourselves appropriately and let's just take this time so that and we can ask god to let his word m move and affect our lives not just something for knowledge's sake it's not something to just memorize but something to live by and you said something beautiful kilmet manfa or a word to live by and that's the important thing there were some saints that went to the desert fathers to ask them a word to live by and then they disappeared for years they didn't come back and then when they came back he said where have you been all this time he said because you, you gave me a word and I think just finally now I'm starting to live by it so now I'm ready for another word some people just want words and some people want words to live by. It's effective and, and it, it really moves their lives. May God give us words to live by. Actually, Rebuna, I like what Paul has said of Guide of Knowing. Hi, Paul. Um, I, like, I like it very much what he said because actually with a lot of Zoom meetings that we are doing, it takes the personal uh, relationship and the quiet time. And I'm afraid that it makes me very used to the idea of the crowd and the community. And when 
when that doesn't happen later on and I have to go to church, now it's easy. I'm staying home. It's it's and and, and I can just be on the picture without even being there. Yeah, it's easy. That that's very easy for me to attend a Zoom a Zoom meeting. But after this is all over soon, inshallah, because we don't have these Zoom meetings, I lose the interest of even going to church. Yeah, sometimes we we count very much on the crowd, and when the crowd is not available or is not around me or 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 it's not easy to be with the crowd. Uh, I lose the, the personal relationship. Now, as much as these new meetings have a big advantage, honestly, to stay connected and support each other, but I, I, I'm, I'm worried that it makes me very dependent on the group and not having this personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Can I, uh, can I say something to that, actually? Um, so... Forgive me for it being like kind of funny, but I had a thought when you were saying this um, about when the people murmured, uh, I, like, you know, obviously I'm, it seems like I'm reading through uh, the books of Moses because I'm going to bring up Moses again. But um, when the people start murmuring about wanting to have the, the meat pots and, and like, you know, the meat from Egypt and the good food and they're complaining against the manna, God promises to send so many, so much meat that it's coming out of their ears and their eyes. And I think a lot of us have complained up to this point um, about like the difficulties of, you know, uh, perhaps travel or the crowds in church. And, um, you know, maybe the first week this seemed easy to us, but it's also from in the same vein, not just church that's on Zoom meetings, but church meetings, work meetings, classes, meetings with friends, uh, phone calls, everything is a device or in front of my eyes or on my ear. It's coming, at, it's literally coming into my eyes and going into my ears to an extent that, you know, it's going to make one sick. And a lot of us are very sick of it. I'm, I'm personally, I'm very, very not much, not a fan of Zoom anymore. I thought it was very nice at first. Uh, seminary uh, got a lot easier for a week. Now it's horrible. Now it's like I miss all of the things that I used to have. Um, so I think I it's actually going to have the opposite effect. I have what you missed. Yeah. Because it's my first Zoom. Oh. <laughs> good, good. It's not going to last very long. <laughs> well, so we have the advice of the saints about maybe at least some minimal things, like, like the point that Dr. Samir said, when this is all finished, we shouldn't be lazy to go to church on Sundays for communion. And this is a must in our life. And the effect that we receive from the liturgy and from the communion, it would work throughout the week until we come for communion the next time. And it was said about the monks that in the old days, there was not daily liturgy like there is now in the monasteries. It was just on Saturday and Sunday that they would go to church. So they were under the assaults of the enemy throughout the week, and they would wait for the sweetness of the body and blood that they received on Sunday to help them for the following week. They would find rest and comfort and sweetness from participating in the liturgy and receiving the Eucharist. And they would get so much strength from that. And then they would go back to their place where they were fighting. So the, the bare minimum is to go to church and receive the Eucharist on Sunday and to gain power from the Eucharist. And then we have all the other things that the church teaches us to help us throughout the week, like the Jesus prayer, where we don't even need to open a book. At any time we can say the Lord's name. 
we have the scripture, which maybe early in the morning before we leave, we can read. These little things that strengthen us throughout our lives, we have to make use of it. Abuna, some, someone texted me a question uh, that uh, he needs to ask you, so I'm going to read it. Probably you touched on it a little bit in, uh, in your last uh, answer. It says, what should I do if I feel that I have poor relationship and not connected to God? How to jumpstart this relationship again? So, St. Augustine said a beautiful thing. He said, I couldn't find you until I looked within. Because our relationships with people are from without. But our relationship with God is from within. And when we calm down and we open our hearts, we'll find God closer to us than we think. Because God is the one who gives us life. Now, when we say that God is the Pantocrator, it's not a matter of he's a creator, but he's the one that's managing my life. He's the one that's giving me life now. He's the one who's working in my cells. He's the one who's making my blood flow. He's the one who's giving me breath. He's very much within me and all around me. Our relationships with people requires a lot of effort. Our relationship with God doesn't require that type of effort. What it requires is that we calm down, we calm ourselves, we calm the thoughts, that we find time alone. And then we'll find God. And with God, we don't have to try to correct ourselves the way we've done with relationships that have broken. God is like the, the father in, in the parable of the prodigal son. He's just waiting for us to come to him. And then he runs and embraces us. He's the one who puts the effort. It's almost as if all that's left for us to do is accept his effort and to change our focus from being on the world to being on what he's done for us. Our relationship with God will get better if we just quiet down and accept what he's done and what he's doing for us. Because he's very close to us. He knows about our lives. He knows about the details. We don't even have to make the effort in saying anything to him. We just have to make the effort in being in his presence and loving his presence. And that's what we lack doing. And the thing that we're lacking the most is to be in God's presence, which is actually not that hard. But we just have to make that our goal. I hope that I answered the person's question. That's great. Yeah, Abby, especially since we have the Holy Spirit inside of us already. I mean, the relationship's already there. It's just a matter of you know, having that relationship strengthened, like what Zuck said. Um, yeah, and it's not like we have to re-find God. It's it's a matter of us choosing to to just make that U-turn, make that metonia, make that, that, that thought process change, that life change, that heart change, um, to reignite that relationship. Because God is here. Like we always say, the great I am, he is. He's present. He's with us. He's not far from us.
But if we have a hard time, like Mina said in the beginning, feeling God's presence. So we can ask him to, to reveal himself to us. Because it's a matter of us finding him. It's not a matter of God doing anything. It's a matter of him being revealed to us. Of us experiencing him. We can pray about not being able to feel him. And he will reveal himself to us. His presence among us. I remember one time before joining the monastery. It was difficult for me because... I was already accepted in the monastery by the bishop of the monastery, but my father of confession at the time, most of you know him, uh, he didn't uh, give me permission to go. And it was a little bit difficult for me, but I was learning actually how to be obedient, which was required for my monasticism. And so uh, one time I was sitting in my apartment upset because I wanted to be at the monastery. I didn't want to be where I was at the time. And I felt very heavy, like I couldn't pray. And I was very upset about not being able to get up and pray. And I remember like not even being able to stand. I just sat on a comfortable chair and I started to cry. And I started to pray to God about not being able to pray. And then I found myself, I had fallen asleep. When I woke up, maybe it was an hour later, I had a completely different experience than before I slept. I felt that whatever burden I was going through was lifted. I felt very light, I felt very joyful, and I was able to get on my knees and pray one of the hours of the Agbeya with my heart. I wasn't burdened, it wasn't heavy, I felt that God was near me. Even though an hour before, I didn't feel any of those things. But I prayed about the way I felt at the time. And so God helped me. He removed the, the feeling that I had, and he, he gave me grace at the time. So we can pray about whatever condition we're in and ask God to help us, help us in whatever condition we're in. And by all means, he will help us. He won't leave us. But we have to pray with trust. And we have to believe that what we ask for, he'll give us. Not like Saint Zechariah, who at one point didn't believe that God will give him a son. He prayed, and he was holy. And scripture says about him that he was blameless. But at one point, he didn't believe that God is actually going to answer his prayer. You know when you ask for something, but you don't think you're going to get it? I mean, when we ask, we have to believe that he'll give it to us. Especially if it's something spiritual and that's good for us. Because God doesn't want to deprive us of anything that's good for us or anything that's his. Trusting that God will give us when we ask him in prayer. And give us what? Give us himself. Mina, you wanted to say something? Oh, I, I'm, I'm nodding in agreement. So you're nodding in agreement? <laughs> um, Dr. Samir. Sorry? I was going to ask Dr. Samir uh, for... You know, can you give us an example in your life of because you, you know, you were my teacher. 
growing up. El afu ya buna na. El afu. And you're still teaching. You're still teaching. Uh, you know, the generations after. You're still <laughs> teaching. <laughs> all the thank God, Abuna, because we would. You don't even want to know, but thank God. No, uh, if I can say something, Abuna. I think I said it, and Paul definitely said it in better English than mine. Uh, and also definitely emphasizes very much. We need as as college people to emphasize on the personal relationship with with God, not only the crowd relationship. And I like very much what Olsak, what Olsak said, that prayers start after the Agbeya, and prayers start after liturgy. We think that I went to liturgy, khalas, I paid my dues, yan zama I did my part, what else do you want from me? Like, it, definitely we need to emphasize the personal relationship and how to go home, lock myself in the room, as we say now, and pray, not only the, the, the big number of people, again, this is very important and I love, everyone here knows how much I love the community and, and the support that we should give to each other, but we also need to emphasize the personal relationship because if my relationship with God is only with the group, um, definitely there is something lacking. Sure. And my most worry, honestly, and when this is over, it's like September 11th. Churches were full of people praying and people repented and people changed and returned to God and then everything goes back to normal when every, uh, back to yeah, original life when everything goes back to normal. That's that's well, honestly my biggest fear. So it's it's um, it, it it continues after we leave. So when we come to church and pray the tizbaha, but when we go out, we still can, yani, I remember when I had a group of bishops here for their conference in Hawaii, I had the blessing of taking them around in uh, a bus. And so while we were sitting in the bus, Amba Yusuf can be dendin il tizbaha. And he was just saying little parts of the tizbaha. Or like he'll say little lines of the liturgy in Coptic. You know, it wasn't just talking with the other bishops on the, on the car ride. Or, you know, they would just sing some of the tizbaha or some of uh, the liturgy as we were driving. But we, we have these prayers at church. But then when we leave the church, we still uh, recite them or we sing them when we're outside. Because I remember when we were young, uh, my cousin Margo, remember Margo? She's here in Honolulu now. Um, yeah. And some other friends. I remember in the car rides, we would pray, we would play liturgy. But I used to like the hymns, all the hymns that we were learning, and sometimes Abuna Hana didn't let, him, let us say it in the church <laughs> because he was very uh, keen on time. Uh, so I always chose to play the people's parts in the liturgy so that I can at least say the hymns in the car rides or when we were together. And I think my cousin Margot would sometimes play the priest because she could never do that in real life. <laughs> and someone else would, would, would play the deacon. And so that's, that was our fun. That was our fun. Um, and then, just like you said, uh, it, it, it doesn't end when we leave the church. It continues when we leave the church. Right. And so that's why uh, we have, you know, a bite together to eat and a happy meal after the liturgy because this is an extension of the fellowship that we had within the church around the altar. It extends to everyday life as symbolized by a meal. It extends at home. It extends at the workplace. It extends on the playground. We have the same kind of attitude and love for each other and prayers and hymnology. This is our life. And this is the life of the Christians. 
and our life should be a life of praise. I remember when I was learning the tazbaha growing up, it wasn't just the tazbaha, but I, I was learning the deaf. <laughs> and it came to a point that even when my brother was studying, I would be singing the tazbaha and playing the deaf, so he would go into my room, grab the deaf, go back to his room, and lock himself in. It's okay, Yanni, to, to study. It's okay to, to praise and sing, but he was also teaching me that I have to be considerate <laughs> to my neighbor. Like I shouldn't distract them when they want to study. I shouldn't distract them uh, when they're doing. That's why the, there's something called the silent prayer as well. And that's very important because when Christ said, you, when you pray, go into your room behind closed doors and pray to your father who sees in secret. We don't have to take that literally. But even when I'm outside on a bus ride or in the car, when I'm at school or at work, I don't have to make my prayer known, but in the silent chamber of my heart, I can pray. And that's something that has to be throughout the day. When St. Paul says, pray without ceasing, and the Bunu Hanna always told us to pray night and day, the Jesus prayer. And God sent us saints so that we can learn how to live the Christian life practically. And this is the practical way. Like Dr. Samir said, to pray when I leave the church. Maybe before you leave for work, you can get up and read scripture or pray a little part of your tazbaha, just a little part. Just little things throughout the day, especially in the mornings and throughout the week, not just on Sunday, like Dr. Sumer said, so that you can be uh, connected. You don't want to ever be disconnected from the source of life even by just our minds, because we're never actually disconnected because he's the one who's giving us life. But we can be disconnected in our own minds. Rabbin Aydin Anam. Ya Rab. Abi, if I may, just uh, piggyback of what Usak and, and Dr. Samir was saying, both of you guys are saying uh, amazing things. But Nasayan, I feel like it's almost within the condition of our generation now to do Yanni, yeah, it's almost bare minimum to what I need to do. Yanni, yeah, even like if we're taking classes in college, for example, the first day when the syllabus would come, we'd see where we need to put our focus in. Those are the things that we're going to focus in. Okay, attendance is like 5%. I won't really have to worry about that. The final 60% have to make sure that I'm there. And it's almost become like that. We've kind of taken, instead of taking the rules of Christianity and applying it practically to our lives, we've done the inverse. We've kind of taken the rules to succeed in our day-to-day -day lives and applied it to our Christianity. It's become flip-flop in our generation to the point where, like Dr. Samir was saying, show up to Sunday, I check the list, I'm good to go. Yeah, I mean, how often do we see the churches full for Nasheya? How often do we see the churches full for Tizbaha? Unless my son Otsak is coming for Tizbaha, we'll see it full. <laughs> for, uh, things of that sort, we've become a uh, yeah, and I like what Amba Yusuf says in some of his talks. We become a spoon-fed generation. Where al of What do I have to do to do the bare minimum and get through this struggle that I call life? Um, that really isn't a struggle after all. But there's a time for everything, Paul. Not yeah. every time is the same. And God is giving us time now so we can make use of the time to open scripture and to sit quietly and to read and and to serve our, our families which we neglect so often you know, this is the time where we can do the things that we don't do too often because we get too busy with you know a rigorous school and work life but that begs the question Abby, is is like if if the state that i'm in right now is the unnatural state of my life where I have now this quote-unquote opportunity, 
that's almost implying that I didn't have the opportunity pre COVID and I won't have the opportunity post COVID, which is a scary thought to even think about because I don't know saying you have to come out of this with a different perspective, with a different idea of the word opportunity and, and things of that sort. And I think that that's, we, we almost, you know, end up in this, in this state of, okay, I need a really, a uh, deposit into my bank account of, of spirituality and Christianity now, because I won't have this opportunity later on, which in and of itself is a scary thought. But, but that's, that's if we have the thought that God is just with us when we're available for him, mm. or he's just with us during the time of prayer or during the time that there's church. But God is also with us at our workplace. God is with us when we're driving. God is with us when we're lying in bed. God is with us at all times. But maybe this is the time that we can use to realize that so that we could make a change in heart, not necessarily a change in what we do, but in the way we do it. Yeah. So like now you're, a lot of you are staying home, you're not working. Or you're working from home. But God is with you when you're in your workplace. And so there's an open door to God even while you're doing these things. And maybe this is the time to realize it so that when we go back to our normal way of life, but we do it with God and not be distracted by Him or be distracted from Him. And our relationship with God, it's at all times. But maybe it's a time like this where we can learn that so that when we go back to our normal things to do, we do it with God in His presence, speaking with Him throughout the day, even while doing all these things. I think, Abuna, if I could just say... Um... Not, not that anything you said made the addition that was perfect, but I'm going to speak anyways. <laughs> Please. Um, something that I really loved that's basically uh, saying a few things that you and, and Paul have been saying is uh, so Paul said, give me a word. And you were talking about um, being uh, having a change of heart and being present. I think that, and uh, Samir was talking about going to church and um, thinking about, um, you know, just kind of like, you know, checking it off. I think sometimes if we're present, then when we go to church, church should affect our, our lives outside. And so one of the, um, and I know that might be like obvious, but the, one of the things that I love really um, very much so from the saints is St. Saint Anthony's story of when he goes into church and he hears the sermon about uh, give it, sell everything you have and give to the poor, um, he is immediately affected by it. He was present in that moment, and he heard the word from church. And it wasn't just that it was a crowd relationship, but the crowd relationship affected his personal relationship with God. And so he proceeded to leave from the church and take that with him throughout his, in the rest of his life. Um, and I think that each time we go to church, instead of seeing them as separate, personal and congregational, rather it is personal through the congregational, and we become the body of Christ and one together and one with Christ together. Um, you know, that, that's, I, I think, just a very beautiful part of the story that I've, I've taken as a reflection. And it doesn't have to be so extreme. It can be like a very small thing that you hear from church. Um, oh, no. Yes, I think um, just uh, just because we're running short on time, but you did mention one thing in the in the beginning. You mentioned something about desire, right? And a lot of a lot of I think the questions that are being asked um, come down to the desire of us, right? Like the the desire of of God's people to get closer to Him or not get closer to Him. I think you talked a lot about you know prayer. Um, you talked a lot about you know being living a prayerful life even outside of the church. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the desire that we have to 
know God and to meet God. Um, and I think ultimately that's kind of what we struggle with, um, getting that desire to, to spend time, to sit, sit alone, sit by ourselves, um, because he will be there if we do that. And we just, we don't, des- is it, it might just not be the, the desire that we have. The desire is not enough. Um, so I guess um, to, to leave you with, with the last word, maybe how do, we, how do we get that desire? Do we ask him like you asked him, I want to learn how to pray. I want to pray better. And you woke up and you were able to do it by his grace. So is that what we're missing to ask him? Um, I would love to ask well, him that. The Lord answered that question because he said, uh, until now you have not asked. If you ask in my name, I will give you. So we can ask him to save us even from ourselves and, and to change our hearts and to, to, to make our desire for him. If we ask him, He'll give it to us. But we have to really, we have to ask, and even if we don't, we know what's good for us sometimes, but we don't do what's good for us. But there's a struggle. We have to be willing to take up that struggle. Like St. Paul says, that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I know I should do, that's not what I do. So there's a struggle that we have to be willing to take up for the sake of godliness. And all the saints have taken that uh, struggle upon themselves. Absolutely. Um, unless, unless we have anything, the Dr. Sindura, Una, please. Um, There's a cross that we have to carry. Right. And so now we're getting into Passion Week. And when we reflect on the cross and how Christ carried the cross, so we ask him also to grant us the grace of carrying the cross and not throwing it. And that's, that's I think, what we can conclude with, uh, you know, this, this week and, and this period. Abuna, sorry, do you help. have any good, um, sorry, spiritual books that are a simple read to uh, read during Passion Week? Um, Anything off the top of your head? If not, well, it's okay. the first thing that always comes to mind is Jesus' dialogue with the Savior, especially the last or the middle of the book on, because he, he gets into what the Paschal Lamb means, what the Pascha is, what Christ did for us. And it gets into there are some chapters about um, his crucifixion, about uh, the resurrection, Pentecost, all of that. Um, I, I always recommend that book. It's a very simple read. It's a beautiful read. Uh, and if you can't find it because it's out of print, Jesus, A Dialogue with the Savior, uh, it's an audio book online. Just put it up and you'll find a blue book that comes up and just click on it. And uh, that's a beautiful book. It's yeah, favorite. I just found it on Google. Thank you. It's also in Abuna's voice. Abuna! Hey? Hi, Abuna. Melek Zahar. <laughs> no, you're the archangel. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the audio book is in Abuna's voice, so it's beautiful. Awesome. I, I hope you can listen to it. Abuna, where are you? How come you're like, like it's just like you're floating? In... <laughs> Background is completely dark and your face is lit. Yani into nowhere. No, it's your light. Thank you for uh, Abuna and Anastasi and for all of your discussion and uh, beautiful time with each other. I hope we can meet yani, in person soon. God, God willing. God willing, fil khamasin, can I stay fit and salli ma ba? Sorry. Can um, Abuna, let's say, can you uh, can you close this in prayer, or Abuna? Anthony, or no, how do you guys do this? Please, Abuna, please. We need your, spray, your prayers, Abuna. After you, Abuna. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, our dear Lord, the 